adjectives that I can think of, ostentatious, monumental, auspicious, unforgettable, memorable, they do me no justice now. The feeling there and the workings of that Congress cannot be described in words. It was great. I think this was about the closest thing I've been to since the Eucharistic Congress, which was held in New Orleans in the, 19, the late 30s. That's a so many years ago. I was just so impressed that uh, I really, I was, I was on a high for a week. These were the delegates at the 1987 Black Catholic Congress. They were trying to explain their feelings about what they experienced at the Congress. What happened to get these people so excited? We can understand the joy and jubilation of the opening mass. We saw that in the first part of this series on the Congress. But now we need to look at what happened after the opening mass. It was not only the mass, but the accomplishments during the days after the mass that brought these glowing adjectives to the lips of the delegates. Let us see what happened after the Thursday evening Mass to move the delegates so much. The first morning session began on schedule, despite the opening Mass ending at midnight. Bishop Ricard officially opened the Congress. It is with great joy and indeed deep humility that we call the National Black Catholic Congress to order and we go about the Congress business. The black bishops were formally recognized and were requested to say a few words. Their presence evoked pride on the part of the delegates. Every bishop was applauded and cheered. They even had Bishop Moses Anderson of Detroit sing for them. What a way to begin, and it gets even better. Each delegation took their turn in front of the microphone as the roll call began of each diocese. Roseanne Harden from the Archdiocese of Omaha, Nebraska. Our bishop is Anthony Maloney and our delegation is Omaha, Nebraska. Please stand. It was just like a national convention. There were cheers and applause for every group. But of most importance was the distinct feeling present that now the people were taking the stage. You could sense the power and significance of this moment. At this time, it became clear to everyone that this Congress was a gathering of all the people. This was a people's convention. I stood up that Friday morning several times as a member of all of the delegations from Texas. I knew that we were there to take care of our father's business and the power of that audience filled me with the knowledge that we were going to do it. These were people chosen by the local diocese. These were true representatives of the black Catholic community. Now we see why the eyes light up and the voices sing when the delegates talk about the Congress. Remember now, this is still the first morning. So what could happen next? The appearance of this gifted woman will top all that has happened so far. Who is this person? Let me introduce to you Sister Francesca Thompson. Her keynote address would make a lasting impression on the delegates. 
Let's join the delegates as Mr. Herbert Johnson of New York City introduces her. Mr. Johnson is president of NAPCA, one of the supporting groups of the Congress. You should know that she has served the black Catholic community and the larger church community with distinction as an educator, an author, a lecturer. She is the recipient of numerous awards, one of which was her selection as the 1986 Teacher of the Year at Fordham University, the Bronx, New York. Those who are familiar with Francesca's dramatic style should know that she comes by it honest. It's in her genes. Her parents were members of the Lafayette Players, the first black dramatic stock company in the United States. They were in existence from 1915 to 1932. We are indeed fortunate to have such a spirit-filled talented individual in the person of Francesca to speak to us today on the challenge of being both black and Catholic. Sisters and brothers, I present to you Sister Francesca Thompson. Well, we come today not to beseech, not to timidly knock, but God-inspired and Jesus-fired to insist to insist upon recognition and long-deserved acceptance. Any doors, any doors which would shut us out must not merely be cautiously cracked. They must be, they must be broken down. We come not to take over, but to blessedly share a richness with which we have been endowed. We come to generously give of a power that has been God given to us. And having dared to reply to our God, send me, we dare to proclaim to our church, here we are, sushi pay, sushi pay. <laughs> our God requires it of you. I like to consider myself a Ku Klux Klanner's dream girl. <laughs> and that is because, you see, there is no time for mourning. We must move now beyond mourning. Our folks know a lot about mourning. But let us mourn no longer. Today is a day of, now is a time of resurrection and new life. It is about giving life, new life, to our church. The work of the black Catholic is monumental, auspicious, awe-inspiring, and cut out for us. We must become mission mission to the church, mission to our brother and sister. There must be less talk about being our brother's keeper and more consideration given to being our brother and sister's brother and sister. That is what evangelization is all about, reaching out to the family, wherever they might be, on the street corners, in the factories, in the welfare lines, yes, even in the gin mills, if that's where we must go to find them and bring them home. The black revolution receives thereby a theological foundation based on the truth that God has bestowed qualities on each person which each other person must respect. Eventually, the new honor whim may be forced to draw upon an intense degree of Christian courage and patience for meaningful confrontation with racist institutions and or policies. All racist institutions, our church notwithstanding.
essential to such a program or plan will be the intensive and extensive use of what I term, hold on to your seats, black power. And here we get many varied and different reactions. Black power is a frightening term. Black power is a negative term. I told you at the outset, I don't believe in negativism. So I say, not so. I see black power as very positive. Without power, all theological or sociological talk, all the talk in the world remains just that, talk. I've been to a lot of meetings, so have you, where there was nothing but talk. This time, this meeting must be about power. Define black power as black freedom, black self-determination, and black pride, wherein we as a people no longer view ourselves as without human dignity, but men and women whole, human beings with a God-given ability to carve out our own destiny. And to those who would say, oh, take your time, change can't come so fast. 1894 was a long time. Christ spoke of the power of the individual, of the power of each of us. I come, he proclaimed. I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Never. Never did he speak about second-class citizenship or subservience in the church. Life abundant, life abundant was his message. Have you heard it? Do you believe it? What I have seen, what I have heard is that God himself intends for me to be recognized as a man and a woman whole. Black power speaks in a unique way to all of us who are authentically black. It reminds us that we are a marginal people, yes. That we are different from the dominant culture, yes. And for that I say thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Never let us say, let well enough alone. Don't rock the boat. Don't be screaming and yelling, the white folks been good to us. No, I say be discontented, be dissatisfied, sweat and grunt under the present existing conditions. Be as restless as the tempestuous billows of the boundless sea. Let your discontent break mountain high against the walls of bigotry. Prejudice, disdain, and ignorance, which would dare keep us out. Let us swamp those walls to their very foundations. Then we shall no longer have to plead for understanding, nor on bended knees continue to beg for acceptance. For we shall at long last be recognized as our God-given worth as brothers and sisters in the human family, men and women whole, then, and not until then, will Catholic be the honest boast of our church. Then, and only then, will we as a believing, faith-filled people have risen to our rightful place in time. Oh, come, my brothers and sisters, let us rise and possess our church. It is God himself who bids, bids us. He sends us God-inspired, Jesus-fired. I say to you, let us rise. Out of the huts of history's shame, let us rise. Up from a past that's been rooted in pain, let us rise. We're a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, we bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, 
Let us rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. Let us rise out of a pain-filled darkness into the dawn. Let us rise. We are the dream and the hope of each black Catholic who's to glory now gone for them and our church. Let us rise. Let us rise. Let us rise. Amen. you that the Congress has just seen its first morning. No wonder the delegates have difficulty in adequately describing their experiences. So much is going on. Oh, I, I felt that Sister Francesca has her hand on the pulse of the black community and that um, she particularly is an inspiration to those of us that must go back into our community because uh, her definition of black power to me uh, being a child of the 60s really brings it all together. She was the most dynamic and inspirational and fired up sister that I've met in a very long time. I brought it back with me. It is a message that I will hear time and time and time again. So while we don't use the word white power uh, because we don't have to use it, it's in place. We're talking about black power as a means of empowering our people. And, and Francesca, who, uh, as she mentioned, uh, or as is mentioned in her biography, does come from a, a family of, uh, of people who were actors and actresses. And she has that ability, using those talents, to incarnate in a very real way what black power is all about. The delegates were then split into groups of 250. A wonderfully orchestrated transit system moved the delegates from the Dufour Center to their group meetings. Each group listened to speakers who spoke on a topic which dealt with black history and culture. For instance, Father Cyprian David spoke on black spirituality. For instance, we speak of Russian spirituality the French spirituality of the 17th century, medieval spirituality, and the spirituality of the Devotio Moderna, of which the imitation of Christ is the greatest example. We also speak of the spirituality of the religious orders, such as the Carmelite spirituality, of which St. Teresa of Avila is the great example. Thus, no Catholic, conscious of his or her religious tradition, would be hesitant to speak of black spirituality. That is, a spiritual tradition with its roots in Africa and expressed in multiple forms wherever the descendants of African people find themselves. Sister Thea Bowman spoke also on this topic and with the flourish brought the delegates to their feet as they were caught up in the excitement of the history of the elders. After the groups of 250 had met with other outstanding speakers, these groups dispersed into groups of 45. In these groups of 45, the delegates would go over a section of the pastoral vision book. So I don't think I want us to confuse ourselves with assuming that just because all blacks are in your church, 100% of them will support the whole issue of gospel mass and expression of the liturgy. So I would, my vote would be for me to continue this because we're having turnover as far as uh, the priests and brothers and sisters are concerned and to make sure that our, our liturgy stay uh, with the black and with the, uh, the spirit and everything that it has now. So uh, I'd be voting for B. It was in these groups that the delegates formulated the pastoral plan. Each group took information found in various sections of the pastoral vision and ranked the ones they considered to be important. 
Being a coordinator of these discussion groups was not without its planning and training. Facilitators had a training session at the Oblates Mother House. That was in April. When we came together, we were in total shock because what we thought the Congress was going to be like, it was not going to be like at all. And we didn't know that the proposals were made already. That was the first shock. Once we understood that the proposals were already made and that our people would be here to say, yes, I want proposal A, B, C, or D, um, we were able to accept that and go from there. It was a difficult training session because we didn't know if people would be in favor of them and we didn't know if people would be able to caucus according to region as to which one they favored and why. Some of the proposals overlap and some of the proposals are not relevant to certain areas and so people that have more concerns in one area are battling with people who didn't have the same priority in a different region. In the evening, the priorities reached by the various groups were brought to the General Assembly. The first evening had its problems. As in any large gathering of people, there will inevitably be misunderstandings. The same occurred at the Congress. Various items were unclear to the delegates. Questions were raised. With the backing of the delegates, Bishop Ricard and Brother Cyprian Rowe, who was facilitator for the gathering, organized the discussion group leaders during the night. The next day, things were worked out amicably. Friday evening finally ended with gospel singing from local parish choirs. The next day, which was the 23rd of May, delegates were greeted by the Pope's ambassador, Archbishop Pio Laghi. It will, be, it will be my prayer that what you have seen and heard here, you will proclaim to those who are searching for the Lord who is life. And with this, I, in the name of the Holy Father, I impart upon all of you and your family the apostolic blessing. May God bless you and thank you. We must minister to, together to one another and to all of those desperately in need. We must, we must weep over the fact that we are but 1.3 million black Catholics in the United States. This has to get to us. This has to mean something. This has to keep us awake at night. This has to make us ask why. We must remind blacks all over the United States that they need not abandon their blackness by becoming Catholics. Father Clarence Williams of Detroit, Michigan, then addressed the Congress. Father Williams, a noted evangelist, spoke of the need to come and go. I say, perish is evangelism first, then evangelization. That we come to accept, belong, and count for Christ in our hearts. And then we go out to present him 
in an acceptable way to the black community, to bring people in to belong to a saving arc in a sinking community, to count for him in the world, in our institutions, in our outreach, in our global worship structure. We have a lot to offer. And then to sell ourselves on ourselves. In a community full of depression and hysteria, esteem is the most precious commodity. When we have black Catholic pride, we have black gold for our community. And finally, my brothers and sisters, before we turn to the task of going, having come, I want you to turn to the person beside you and shake their hand and say, let's become a double duty disciple. Turn to the other person to the other side of you and tell them, let's sell ourselves on ourselves. That Saturday afternoon, there were more speakers. and the small group discussions, any previous problems were straightened out. The evening general session saw misunderstandings resolved. The night ended with a jazz concert. If it sounded like a lot was going on that Friday and Saturday, you are absolutely correct. The delegates were tired, but happy to be a part of history. Oh Lord, there were a whole many who said, we can't get this Congress off the ground. It will never happen. Black folk gonna get up there and it won't act right. <laughs> Nothing's gonna be right. The logistics won't work right. The food's gonna be terrible. All the naysayers had to eat crow uh -huh. on the 24th. The Congress was moving to its triumphant conclusion. Thursday was the jubilant beginning. Friday and Saturday were days full of work and deliberation. But through it all, something grand and unforgettable was being forged. The National Black Catholic Pastoral Plan, which would be unveiled Sunday morning, the 24th of May, this pastoral plan will be the third and final presentation on the 1987 Black Catholic Congress. The Congress was indeed hard at work. We have seen delegates taking their jobs seriously. These days were filled from sunup to sundown. What can we learn from these moments we've just witnessed? Very simple. Never stop saying it loud. One of my favorite stories is told about one of these sheroes. Sojourner Truth. This was a woman, you will recall, who felt that she had been given a job by God, a job of freeing and releasing her folks held in chains. She was also the mother of 18 children, all of whom had been sold into slavery. The story is told that one night, many, many years after she had made her last trip south and she was living with some friends in the north, she stood in their backyard and she looked up at the star-filled sky and she hummed, kind of a keening sound it was. And a little child watching her asked her very solicitously, what you look up at the sky like that for, old mother? Why are you looking at the stars? And this faith-filled deliverer, this mother of 18 children, whom had all been snatched mercilessly from her bosom before she had the mother's joy of hearing their first words or seeing them take their first step, this faith-filled woman gave a faith 
full answer, one worthy to be remembered and never forgotten. For she said, Oh, I, I look so at the stars sometimes, child. I look up at all them stars. And I know that my children, wherever they be, and I sure don't know where they be, but I know that they look up at the same stars. And for just a little while, it bring us closer together. If the closest we're ever going to be this side of glory. And I thanks the good God that gave us them stars. Hey, the almighty good God to let me feel close to my children. Hey, the almighty good God.